we're going to look at a very important aspect of Christian life this evening. Uh, the topic actually is uh, uh, talking the walk, talking the walk, uh, preaching what you practice. Normally, uh, in the world, they say that you must practice what you preach, walk the talk, meaning whatever you speak, you must uh, follow it. But actually, in the Bible, God exhorts us to be people who first do and then teach. It's not practicing what you're preaching, but preaching or teaching what you practice. First practice, then share with people. Now, if you look at the book of Acts in chapter 1, verse 1, uh, Luke writes, Luke is the one who wrote the uh, Gospel of Luke as well as uh, the book of Acts. And uh, he begins by saying in verse 1, in my former book, Theophilus, most excellent Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Do and teach. That's the Gospel of Luke. Former book means what? Luke, Gospel of Luke. And uh, the book of Acts basically is a continuation of the uh, Gospel of Luke. If you look at the last few verses of the 24th chapter of Luke, uh, it's a continuation it's in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 1 to 8. And uh, it talks about his former book, the gospel. He wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. A very big lesson for all of us. And whatever we hear, whatever we read in the Bible, we first do it and then we share it. Do and teach. Similarly, we'll find in 1 Corinthians 4.17, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth and he uh, writes to him and says, I remind you, uh, I, I, I was 16, I urge you to imitate me. I'm sending you my son Timothy. For this reason, I'm sending my son Timothy. He will remind you about my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees what I teach everywhere in every church. Whatever I teach anywhere in any church, I live it. And Timothy will remind you about my way of life in Christ. And Timothy knew all about uh, the Apostle Paul because Paul was a mentor to Timothy. And as a mentor, we have to be transparent. Like Jesus tells about to his disciples in John 10, 14, I know my sheep, my sheep know me. Transparency. And uh, to Timothy, he wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, suffering. What a combination of uh, his lifestyle. You know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, suffering. So Paul's life was a transparent life. Whatever he shared and taught, he lived it. And fascinatingly, to the Philippians, he wrote in Philippians chapter 4, verse 9, Philippians 4, 9, whatever learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Meaning whatever heard from me, seen in, seen in me, my life is open before you. Whatever I am, you've seen my life, you've seen, heard my teaching, live it. Then you preserve the peace God has given us. Very often I speak about preserving the peace God has given us. In John 14, 27, Jesus says, says Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. He's given us his peace. We preserve that peace by walking obediently to God's word. And Paul writes to Philippians and says, what you heard, received, or heard from me, or seen in me, put into practice, God of peace will be with you. Lesson for all of us, that whatever we listen, we read, we first obey, apply it. Otherwise, we are deceiving ourselves. In James chapter 1, verse 22, James writes, don't listen to the word of God and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. When you listen to the word of God and does not do what it says, it's like a man looks at his face in a mirror and goes away and forgets what it looks like. 
But the man looks intently to the perfect law that gives freedom and continues doing it, <clears throat> not forgetting what is heard. He be blessed in what he does. The word blessed here is happy, makarios, happy. When you hear the word of God and obey it, not just listen and not follow, then you're deceiving yourself. When you obey, your life is going to be so much blessed and, uh, and your peace and joy be infectious to other people, they'll be touched by it. So all of us are called to obey scriptures and follow it. In the Old Testament, we read about Ezra. Ezra was a scribe. He was a teacher. And in the book of Ezra, chapter 7, verse 10, we read, Ezra devoted himself to the study of God's word, devoted himself to the study of God's word, observing God's word, meaning obeying it, and teaching. Studying, obeying, and teaching. Teaching follows your obedience. Obedience is a result of studying. So as we hear the word, read the word, what God expects us to first follow it, obey it, and from our life, we communicate to others, teach others what we have learned and what we have practiced. To Timothy, again, Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, what have you heard me say before many witnesses? What have you heard me say before many witnesses? Entrust to reliable people who will be qualified to teach others. What he heard me speak before many witnesses. Timothy was always uh, uh, understudied to, uh, to Paul. So very often he traveled with Paul. And what he, Timothy heard before uh, what Paul preached to many people, he said, what he heard me declare. You also in turn entrust reliable people who will be qualified to teach others. How are they qualified? Not with necessarily with degrees or uh, theological degrees. Qualified because whatever they've heard, they obey. When you obey, you qualify to speak because you are living it. You have right to speak what you obey because you've seen it, you experienced it. This qualification is not degrees of in, in divinity and, and in uh, theology. Qualified means people who will hear the word, who do it, who practice it, and from their experience, they share with people what they learned and experience. So we are called to be a people who live what we believe and then share. And to live what we believe must first believe it is God's word. We speak because we believe it. In 2 Corinthians 4.13, Paul writes, 2 Corinthians 4.13, it's written, it's written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. It's written in scripture, I believe, therefore I speak. So I believe, and if you really believe the word of God, it's the word of God, you'll tremble at his word. And trembling means you simply obey. And sharing and teaching follows our obedience. Now the amazing thing about this obedience and teaching is that your teaching comes from your life. I'll take, for example, a simple thing like teaching on forgiveness. Forgiveness. Now, unless you forgive, how can the teaching be effective? It's a different thing that people can hear the teaching and apply in their lives. I'm not saying no. But when you forgive people unconditionally, because that's what you're called to do in the New Testament, after the cross, Christ forgave us on the cross unconditionally. He paid for the people who, who crucified him. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. No one said sorry. No one repented. He forgave. Of course, people say, well, he can forgive. He's God, become man. Sinless. I'm not like him. I'm a sinner. I'm a human being. I can't do what he did. What about Stephen, who was being stoned to death? While being stoned to death, he prays for the people who are responsible for stoning him, including Saul. While being stoned, just because he's about to leave this world, this, the, the, the spirit will be taken away from him because he's going to die. In Acts chapter 7, verse 60, 60 he says, Lord, don't do, hold the sin against them. He sees heaven open. 
He is standing at God's right hand. He says, Lord, don't hold the sin against them. And one among them was Saul. So he forgave unconditionally. Today we are called to forgive unconditionally. Also when we forgive, we should forget. Because the Bible exhorts us to be people who forgive as the Lord forgave. Colossians chapter 3 verse 13. Forgive as the Lord forgave. When God forgave, he forgave unconditionally. And when he forgives, he chooses to forget. Jeremiah 31, 34. A prophecy about New Testament believers. I will forgive their sins and remember their sins no more. So we are called to forgive in the same way. Forgive as the Lord forgave. Unless we receive forgiveness from God, we can't forgive others. Unless we know and believe our sins have been forgiven unconditionally by the blood of Christ, and God has chosen to forget our sins, we can't forgive the way God forgave and forget it. We are called to forget other people's sins against us. When we do that and then speak of forgiveness, that message comes from joy. Joy of obedience. Joy of practicing what you have understood. After practicing, sharing with joy for others to have the same joy of forgiveness. On the other hand, if you don't forgive and then speak on forgiveness, after all, you can get so many verses on forgiveness from the Bible. I'll quote it. No problem. But it won't come with the joy of having obeyed God. Imagine forgiving and forgetting. When your mind is free of bitterness, it's a, it's a clean mind. We are set free. On the other hand, when we have unforgiveness against a particular person, it's like drinking poison and expecting him to die. We are called to forgive others, others like God forgave, and not remember their sins. One of the descriptions of love in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 13, chapter verse 5 is, love keeps no record of wrongs. And we are called to love enemies. Matthew 5, 43, 44. Jesus said to, during the Sermon on the Mount, you heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's Old Testament time. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Loving enemies means what? Love keeps no record of wrongs. So loving enemies means not keeping a record of enemies' wrongs against you. When you do that, there's freedom and joy. If you don't do that, it's like drinking poison and expecting that person to die against whom we have bitterness. So one very important uh, reference I gave, I mean, example I gave, there's so many aspects of Christian life. When you do it and then you speak and share with people, it comes with experience, comes with power, comes with joy. And this joy of obedience is infectious. A particular uh, topic when you speak and after living it, it comes with conviction, joy and peace. Because as you speak, you will know you are doing, or I have done what you are sharing. Now, Sometimes we may not be, be doing it, but God wants the willingness for us to do it. The willingness. Like loving enemies. It requires faith to love enemies. It requires anointing of the Holy Spirit to love enemies. Even forgiveness for that matter. Are we willing to forgive? For willing to forgive also you can speak on forgiveness because you know what God wants from you. You can share with people what I'm sharing today. I really want to do it. I'm asking God. God wants willingness. You can even tell God, Lord, I'm willing to do what you want me to do. As I'm going to speak on this topic today, Lord, give me the strength to do what I should be doing. I'm willing. You can even pray and say, Lord, I'm willing to be willing to be willing to be willing to do it. There's enough for God. And he will empower us to do it by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So, as much as possible, please live it and then share it. Then it becomes 
your experience. In 2 Timothy 2.8, Paul writes about, this is my gospel. This is my gospel. Have you ever noticed that the way he says my gospel? What is the meaning of gospel? Good news. This is good news for me. I am saved. My sin has been forgiven by his work on the cross. Gospel is for me. For everybody, yes. But I am sharing my gospel because I have experienced the confidence my sin has been forgiven and forgotten. So gospel becomes our gospel. Our good news. Personal good news for us. That's why we share good news with joy and love. Knowing fully well this is good news for everybody. So please obey God's word and then share. Sometimes people ask me, you know, brother, we heard the message you spoke that day. Can I go and share the same message in my church? Should I quote your name? I said, don't have to quote my name. It's not my message. The message God gave me to share with people. It's his message. His word, not my word. By all means, go and share. Don't have to quote my name. But only thing is, be sure you practice and then go and share. Or rather, be willing to practice it. Lord, I'm willing to do this, Lord. Having an opportunity to do it, Lord. I'm willing to do it. With that, you can go and speak, no problem. But if you can do it, do it. And from your experience of doing it, you go and share with people. Now, when you share with people, not only God's word you share, as God's people, you're also called to correct people. Second Timothy, third chapter. 16, 17. All scriptures God breath, use it for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. That the man of God will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now we are called to correct people also. When you correct people, make sure you don't have the same weakness or sin he's having. Because correcting people is to judge their, their, uh, their sinfulness, not giving condemnation or punishment, but identifying sin for what it is. We are called to judge each other in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 5.12, Paul writes to, to the church in, in Corinth, what business is mind to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside the church? God will judge those outside the church. Which means we are supposed to judge each other within the body of Christ. When I think of judging people, correcting them, I'm talking about correcting them, not giving punishment to them, identifying sin, telling the sin is there, please turn from it. Now, Christians don't want to do that because they take a passage from the Bible and don't read the whole passage or only two verses in that. Seven chapter of Matthew, verse one and two, where Jesus says, do not judge or you will be judged. But the same measure you judge, you will be judged. We stop right there. We don't go to the next verses. And Jesus says, how can you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your eye? You hypocrite. First, remove the plank you can see better to remove the speck. How can you say it to your brother, let me remove the, plank, uh, uh, the speck in your eye when you have a, uh, a plank in your own eye? How can you say that? How can you look at a speck and you've got a plank? How can you tell them, let me remove the speck? And all the time you've got a plank. Lord says, you hypocrite, remove the plank, you can see better remove the speck. So the solution is not, not judging. Don't look at the first two verses alone. Look at three, four, and five. Solution is, Removing the plank, being able to see better to remove the speck. And don't forget the speck of sawdust and plank of same material. Same material, wood. Speck of sawdust, plank. What it really means is, when you find your brother having a particular weakness or sin in his life, to a small extent, you have the same sin in a larger extent, don't judge him or you'll be judged. You've got a big plank, you've got a small speck, same sin. You come out of here, practice it, turn from it. 
then you have experience of coming out of it, then you can help the other person come out of it. The solution is, we are supposed to judge each other in the body of Christ after coming out of the sin that we have, which we had, that other person has now, we have had before, come out of it, you can help them come out of it. That's the spirit behind 7th chapter of Matthew, was 1 to 5. We shouldn't judge those outside the church. They're ignorant. When Paul went to Athens, he found a city full of idols. He was distressed at idol worship. But is commending them for the religiosity. He says, I see you very religious people. I went around and saw objects of many objects of worship. I even found out an unknown God. What you worship is unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. Then he says in 30th verse, Acts 17, chapter verse 30. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. So, whether it is teaching, correcting, always make sure what you're doing or telling people is from a life that is overcome it. And at least be willing to overcome it. Take, for example, it could be that we may not have the option to practice what we're going to preach. Opposing God gives you a topic to speak on, let's say, enduring persecution. Enduring persecution, okay? If God were to ask me to speak on that, I speak very often on persecution, enduring persecution. But I've not been persecuted. I've not been persecuted so far. I have people who are against me. They are against me to talk against me, but not persecution. Persecution is a very big word. I haven't shed blood for Jesus. Does it mean I don't, don't uh, speak on, I shouldn't speak on persecution? No. The thing is, if that topic comes to me, I have to decide in my heart, I will endure. I'm willing to endure persecution. Every time persecution will not go away. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5 Endure hardships. Endure hardships. In the case of Paul, he had endured hardships. He knew how to handle persecution. For his own life he spoke. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12, he writes, when we are cursed, we blessed. When we curse, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Look at the amazing response to people who curse, people who persecute, people who slander. So when we are cursed, we bless them. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. He lived it. Therefore, from his life, he's talking to Timothy and saying, writing to Timothy and saying, endure hardships. He also explains how to endure hardships. Beautiful, isn't it? A little how he endured hardship. By the power of God. 2 Timothy 1.8. Timothy, don't be ashamed to testify about the Lord or ashamed of me as prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. By the power of God, you can endure hardships. And the Apostle Paul endured hardships. 11th and 12th verse. Of this gospel, I made a herald, an apostle and a teacher. That's why I'm suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed. I'm convinced he's able to guard what I have interested him for that day. So in the case of Paul, he endured hardships. Therefore, he says confidently, Timothy, endure hardships. Don't expect to go immediately. In the case of Thessalonians, he understood how they endured hardships. They endured through hope. He's commending the church in Thessalonica. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. He said, thank God for you, for a work produced by faith, labor of love, and endurance inspired by hope. Christ is our hope. In everything, there's hope in him. We endure through hope, endure by the power of God. Now, you and me, if God wants me to speak on persecution, endurance, I speak on endurance, of course. But then before I speak, I have to decide in my heart, am I willing to endure? Am I willing to endure? I'm not yet endured because there's no question of persecution. I've not had persecution my personal life. 
Yes, I have people against me. Uh, people who trouble me. But then, I bless them. This much I can say. In these 40 years, I've had, uh, I've disobeyed, disobeyed God many times, in thought, word, and deed. But one area where I always had victory was in blessing people who curse me. In forgiving people unconditionally. In loving people who are my enemies. Loving people who are my enemies. By praying for them. But it, persecution, I've not had. That doesn't mean I can't speak on persecution. Before I speak, I, I decide, am I willing to obey? God wants willingness. When a person comes, of course, normal tendency is Lord to say, take away this problem, Lord. Take away difficult people, Lord. But they don't go away. I won't complain. I say, Lord, endure. I want to endure. Empower me. Give me wisdom to endure. And power to endure. You know, wisdom will teach us why sufferings have come. In Colossians chapter 1 from verse 9, the Apostle Paul is uh, praying, uh, sharing his prayer for the Colossian church. Since they heard about you, we don't stop praying for you. Asking God to fill you the knowledge of his will through spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this and we live lives worthy of God pleasing him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in this knowledge, I mean, strength with all power, according to God's might, having great endurance and patience, endurance and patience, and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who's qualified to share the ignorance of the saints in the kingdom of light. They have God's wisdom and God's power. They can face every crisis. So when I speak, speak on persecution, prospective persecution. I'm not persecuted yet. I'm going to decide in my heart. When persecution comes to me, Lord, am I going to ask you to go away or am I going to ask you for strength and wisdom to endure? Yes, I ask God. Lord, I'm willing to endure. Give me wisdom and give me strength. God wants willingness. The Lord uh, wrote to the church in Thyatira, gave a message to Thyatira in the book of Revelation in chapter 2 of Revelation, verse 20. The 20 and 21, we read about. He had this against this church because this church tolerated a woman called Jezebel who by teaching misled God's people into worship of, uh, into food, eating food, food sacrifice idols and to sexual immorality. By teaching, she uh, incited the church in Thyatira to eat food, sacrifice idols, and then sexual immorality. The Lord says, I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is not willing. She was not willing. So God wants willingness. So when you pick on some particular topic, if you don't have the opportunity to apply it already, be willing to do it. Like persecution, I give an example. And when you're willing to do it, strength will come. Now, the third possibility is there's no occasion for you to do it. No chance of doing it. One is you have this occasion, uh, the privilege of obeying. Opportunity has come. You obey and teach. Or it is not come, like persecution, be willing to do it. And you can speak. You'll have the conference to speak. Third possibility there's no occasion to practice it. I'll give an example. The Apostle Paul was not married. 1 Corinthians 7, chapter verse 8. I wish everybody, everybody was unmarried like I am. I wish everybody was unmarried like I am. He was unmarried. But he spoke on husband wife relationships. Isn't it fascinating? How wonderfully he wrote about uh, husband wife relationships. Efficient church. Fifth chapter, Ephesians, verse 22 to 32. Colossians, he spoke about husband by relationships. He was not a married person. But being a servant of God, he listened to God and spoke. No chance of practicing. He's not married. How can you talk about husband by relationships? not married. But he listened to God and spoke out. If he's married, he would have been required to obey and then teach. Sometimes it's possible that certain things we speak on, that God will speak on, 
you will not have time to uh, occasion to practice it. I'll give an example, my own life. A few years back, I was, I was in, uh, in a, a northeastern city and I invited to speak to the uh, members of uh, legislative, legislative assembly. Chief Minister was there, bureaucrats were there, MLAs were there. I was supposed to speak on a Saturday uh, afternoon for two hours on spiritual perspective of governance. Spiritual perspective of governance. To whom? to people who are in positions of authority, govern governors, governing the state. I won't mention the state where I spoke. Chief Minister was there. The bureaucrats were there. Chief Secretary, Executive Chief Secretary was there. MLAs were there. Bureaucrats were there. That morning when I was told to speak on this topic, I said, Lord, I'm not a governor. I'm not a political leader. How can I speak on this topic, Lord? And the Lord, in a way, rebuked me. Was Paul married? No, Lord. He wrote about marriage. You're not a governor, but you can speak on governance because I'll give you the words to speak. So two hours I spoke on governance. We had question and answer time also, answer all the questions by the grace of God. So when there's no occasion to practice, doesn't matter you can't speak. Listen to God. But if the occasion for you to practice it, please live it and then share. First walk, then talk. First practice, then preach. So the question of a relationship with God, number one. Are we listening to God and doing what he wants, whatever he tells us to do? As God's people, we listen to God and speak out. That's the meaning of prophecy. The Apostle Paul exhorts the church in Corinth to eagerly desire spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians, 14 chapter verse 1, he writes, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Follow love, desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Prophecy means what? Hearing from God and speaking out. What God speaks to you, you speak out. And we speak out always to bless people because God always speaks to us to bless people. In the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4, Isaiah writes, The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one big thought. Early morning, he wakes me up to listen to him like one being taught, to know the word, to sustain weary people. This day is going to meet weary people, troubled people, harassed people. They want encouragement. They need encouragement. So as a prophet of God, listen to God and spoke out. In the same way, all of us, we meet a lot of people in the world, among Christians also, who are troubled, who are discouraged, who are fearful, and God wants to encourage them. Prophecy is always for exhortation, strengthening, and comfort. To strengthen people, to encourage people. And Paul is exhorting the church in Corinth, follow love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. The prophecy is for encouraging people. I mean, desire this gift we are inclined, God is inclined to give it to us. We move God's heart to give it to us. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 4 says, Hebrews 2 4, God distributes his gifts according to his will. The word will is not telesis. Uh, sorry, it's not telema, it's telesis. Telema is a word for wish of God, desire of God. Here it is telesis. Telesis means inclination. He gives us gifts according to how he's inclined to give. When you desire something very ardently, he's inclined to give it to us. Now, when you seek this gift of prophecy, to be able to hear from God and speak out, remember, it's to encourage people. Also, as you hear from God, first do it. Ezra studied God's word, obeyed, and taught. So whatever God speaks to you, if you have not done it, 
do it, if you're not able to do it, not have the opportunity to do it, willing to do it, no chance of doing it, anyway, share. Like Paul spoke about married life without being married. So the question is, we have to be honest, transparent before God and be willing to obey whatever he tells us to do. We are called to tremble at his word. Philippians 2.12, Paul writes to the church in Philippi. As I always obeyed, not only in my presence, not also in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For God will work in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Work out your salvation, not working for salvation, working out. Peace and joy coming out. Christ is coming out, holding out the word of life, who is Christ. All comes back to obedience. As you hear or read, obey and teach, will bear fruit and that peace and joy will become infectious. As a calling for all of us. Now, the other way around. What about listening to people who are preaching and teaching? Suppose they are not obeying what they are teaching, should you listen or not? Supposing someone is preaching and teaching God's word, he, he must obey and teach. That's a calling for him. As a listener to God's word, are you going to close their ears because the person who's speaking is not applying? Don't do it. If it's from God's word, take it as God's word. The Lord Jesus Christ rebuked the Pharisees for the hypocrisy. Look at the 23rd chapter of Matthew. You find that he's rebooking the Pharisees one to one for the hypocrisy. He called them snakes, whitewashed walls. He rebuked them for not removing the sin in the heart. He told them, 20th chapter of Matthew, 25, 26. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, inside is full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside, outside will be clean. Let your life be right before God. Then you can talk outside. He rebuked them for their hypocrisy. He was very severe with the hypocrites. But then look what advice his people, his own disciples advising. Read that chapter of Matthew, verse 1 and 2. He tells them, the teachers of the law, Sit in Moses' seat. Do everything they tell you to do. Do everything they tell you to do. But don't do what they do. They don't practice what they preach. However, they are concerned. The, the Pharisees, they're supposed to obey and teach. They're not doing that. They're preaching and not even obeying. What about the people hearing the word of God? The Lord does not tell them, don't listen to them. They're hypocrites, don't listen to them. He doesn't say that. Listen to them, he says. Do what they tell you to do, but don't do what they do. They don't practice what they preach, meaning I can deal with them. I'll deal with them, but you listen to them. Because what they were teaching was from the Bible. Very simple. The most amazing thing is, he's telling his own disciples, his own disciples, Peter, James, and John, and others. He could have said, I'm here, listen to me, my teaching. What do you want to go to them? They're hypocrites. Don't listen to them. He said, no, listen to them. Because those days, they read the scriptures in the synagogues. They read it. For example, when Jesus went to the synagogue in Galilee. They gave him the score of the prophet Isaiah. He read it out. So when someone reads the scriptures or speaks from the scriptures, don't filter the message based on who is speaking. Filter based on the recording to God's word. Because God's word, I will listen. And therefore, we must know how to share the word, how to listen to the word. Sharing word, whatever you understand, live it, practice it, and then preach. It will come with joy, come with conviction, it will come with power. Because you know whatever you are sharing, is your experience. And I tell you, forgiveness is a tremendous topic to speak on. As you speak on forgiveness, after forgiving, people listen to you, they will know. They will know that this guy is speaking from his life. They can discern. But you simply quote verses on forgiveness and don't forgive, and bitterness comes through, 
They might have accepted because God's word. They might, but then they won't be touched by the power of the word because it's not from your life. They have open heart for God. God can speak directly. There's no doubt of it. Again, loving enemies. Many people suffer, uh, struggle with that. They struggle with that, loving enemies. But then we can do it by the Holy Spirit's anointing. This love is a love in the spirit. Colossians chapter 1, verse 8. A love in the spirit. The church in Colossae was known for their faith in Christ and love for each other. And the love was in the spirit. Romans chapter 5, verse 2, Paul writes, We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, we rejoice in our suffering. For suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, Try to hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love is poured on us the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. So ask God for his love. And uh, we can't avoid speaking about loving enemies because that's the essence of New Testament teaching, Jesus teaching, love. Not just, not just loving God, first loving God, with all our heart, soul, mind and strength, loving our neighbor as ourselves. That's a summary of the Old Testament uh, law. All the laws of Old Testament summed up in two laws. But the Lord added something else. Well, something else is, I say unto you, love your enemies. Matthew 5, 43, 44. You heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Who's saying? Jesus is saying. And today we are constrained by the love of God. To obey the teachings of Jesus. John 14, 23. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. Now to love enemies, we can't do it by our own strength. So if, for example, God sp speaks to you to speak on this topic somewhere, in your heart, decide to forgive your enemies and love them. And be willing to love them. Lord, I am willing, Lord. Like I said earlier, I'm willing to be willing to be willing. Help me. And as long as you ask something according to God's will, he will hear. He can surely will give you victory. So taste for, for yourself. Taste for yourself the amazing love of God to enable us to do what we understand before we speak. So Timothy, Paul told, what he heard me speak by many people, enters to life people, they qualify to teach others. Qualified means because they will be able to do what uh, they understand. And Timothy was a person who was following Paul. He was an understudy to Paul. Paul was his mentor and uh, guiding him. And therefore, Paul knew Timothy will obey. If not, then it is later on. Because when they are both in prison, and Paul wrote the letter, Timothy was ashamed to testify about the Lord, ashamed of Paul the prisoner. But Paul encouraged him. Timothy was a very young person. Later on, after Paul when they be with the Lord, I'm sure Timothy would have changed. We all change for the better. We are all works of God, workmanship of God. We are in the process of being refined like gold refined through fire. We are works in progress. God is at work in us to will and to act on his good purpose. So summarize, number one, before you speak, Live it and speak. No opportunity yet. Be willing to live and speak. Let endurance in persecution. Before talk on persecution, be willing to endure persecution. To endure, it gives us hope. It gives us power. Third possibility is no occasion. No chance because Paul was not married, but he spoke. That's because he had fellowship with the Spirit. So sometimes there's no possibility for us to uh, live and speak, anyway speak. Because people listening to you, they will have the opportunity. Remember, the focus is on God and people, not ourselves. To glorify God and edify people. What is useful to them, you share. They'll be able to obey. I'm sure the, the families in Colossae and Ephesus were so blessed by Paul teaching on family life. Paul was not married, but they, he blessed them by the word. And can you imagine, after 2,000 years, 
we are so blessed by that teaching because the source of that teaching is the Holy Spirit. So we have to live by the Spirit. And I'm not saying if you don't live and then teach, it won't have an effect. You will have the same effect. We'll have the joy of speaking when you live it. Romans 14, 17, 18. For well, the kingdom of God, not a matter of eating and drinking, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. For whoever serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by people. Pleasing to God and approved by people when you actually preach and teach what you practice. So it is actually not talking, uh, not walking the talk, talking the walk. It's not practicing what you're preaching, but preaching what you practice. May God bless us, the, bless us and give us the wisdom and the strength to do what you learn, what you learn today, we have to do it also. I do believe God will enable us and uh, praise God for the joy of serving Him, joy of obeying Him, joy of sharing and blessing people through His Word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for each one of us on the Zoom. Help us, Lord, first obey what you teach us, Lord, and then do it, Lord. Not deceive ourselves, but be a blessing, Lord, as you bless us, Lord. Help us live your word, Lord. Let the word become flesh in us, Lord. Thank you, Master. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise, Lord. Thank you, your word is life. Help us manifest that life, Lord, as you obey you, Lord. We need your wisdom, we need your strength. We pray for all of us, Lord, in the name of Jesus, by the Holy Spirit's anointing and sanctification, we'll all live holy and godly lives, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.